in the tense months between March 1914 and the end of July that year, Ireland stood dangerously close to civil war. As the Home Rule Bill entered its final stages, the British government became concerned that Unionist volunteers were planning the seizure of arms in Ulster. So they decided to deploy extra troops to the north, as we hear now in this letter written by 2nd Lieutenant W. Scott Watson to his father on the 20th of March 1914. This evening, I and the other officers of our regiment were called upon to make the most momentous decision of our lives. We were all assembled in the Colonel's office, and he read out the following proclamation from the War Office. In view of the possible active operations in Ulster, all officers domiciled in Ulster will be allowed to disappear from Ireland till the operations are over. Any officer who, for conscientious reasons, refuses to take part in these operations will send in an application by 10 a.m. tomorrow. Any officer doing so will be dismissed from the service. This, we are all agreed, is the greatest outrage that has ever been perpetrated on the service. We have had to make this decision without any opportunity of discussing it with our people. Seven in my brigade have decided to refuse and will probably be dismissed from the service either tomorrow or very shortly. I have decided to stay on. But, as you know, my sympathies are absolutely with Ulster. I think that at a time like this the army must stick together. If we once start to disintegrate the service, then goodbye to the Empire and anything else that matters. So the lieutenant stayed on, but a group of his fellow officers made a stand. They stated they would refuse any orders to carry out operations in Ulster, which might result in a clash with loyalists. Elements of the British Army were based in Curra Camp in County Kildare, and this month marks the centenary of what's become known as the Curra Incident. Conor Mulva, lecturer in Irish history at UCD, and their man working on the decade of commemorations, is here to tell me about the events that occurred between Dublin, London and the Curra Camp in March 1914. It was a, a tricky time to say to put it mildly in the history of these islands give us the background I think this is one of the most incredible events and at the time Walter Long certainly um, wrote down in, in one of his letters that if it proves that all these um transactions and and actions are true then this will be the most incredible story in history both of fact or fiction and I think that gives us a sense of just how momentous this was seen as an event it not only encapsulated I suppose the question that the entire British military was not reliable to the the cabinet and the civil government five months out from the first world war but also it meant that the whole home rule project the whole question of law and order in Ireland was in question and on the rocks. Um, and essentially what it was about was the use of the army as opposed to the use of the, the police. The RIC theoretically could have handled any loyalist threat to arms to, to, to official arms dumps in Northern Ireland. This links into two um, different factors, one being quite subsequent to the event, which is Lloyd George during the Anglo-Irish War of Independence. He wanted to keep the affair as a police-run incident rather than involving the army this making it a little bit more complex and also previously the Welsh miner strikes and the coal strikes of 1912 1913 in Britain these were affairs where the, the cabinet had yet, yet again used the military to try and intervene in civil affairs so this was seen as a, a dangerous breach but very much this was again an incident where they wanted to use the army to, to impose civil law and that, that was a very dangerous departure from precedent. OK, let's let's get into semantics here because I prefer to think of it as a mutiny as opposed to an incident. You don't accept that. You, it wasn't technically a mutiny. Why not? Technically, the Curra incident or the Curra crisis isn't a mutiny because no orders were issued. The officers in question were told that you might be ordered to go to Ulster. And they said, well, if I am ordered to go to Ulster, I won't go. I, I would refuse to forego my entire career in the military, resign my commission and lose my pension, all the other benefits and, and simply on a moral stand not comply with this. However, that order was never given. Therefore, technically, and we're going into dictionary definitions here, this wasn't a mutiny because no orders were given. However, to call it an incident, I would argue, might air on the side of making this... It's a little bit bland. It's it's quite bland for something that was really, really serious because unlike other mutinies and there are lots of mutinies during... Well, not lots, but there are a surprisingly uh, few amount of of mutinies during the First World War and subsequently in the British Army. They involve privates, NCOs, people in, in the ranks. 
this is officers and at that senior officers a brigadier general of the mm. British Army says if you order me to do something I won't do it OK we'll talk about him now because he's one of my least favourite uh, characters in Irish history he was an Irishman brigadier general Sir Hubert Gough essentially he was the, the ringleader there's a meeting he summoned along with other officers current officers to a meeting in London and you would accept that they would have a, a few strips torn off them what actually happened when they got there and they had uh, an interview with the Secretary of State for War J.E.B. Seeley. So after Gough says that he won't comply with any orders given to him and that he isn't reliable as an officer to carry out actions in Ulster, the Secretary of State for War summons Gough and his fellow mutineers over to the war office in London and when they they get there they expect to get at the very least a rap over the knuckles or probably a dismissal from the army. Instead, and this is what's the most amazing thing about the Curragh crisis, they walk out of that meeting with a piece of paper and on that piece of paper is written that you will not be forced to make this impossible choice, you will not be forced to carry out any actions in Ulster. And this is an and incredible was, thing. Was, was that meeting minuted? Do we know what actually took place at that meeting? Uh, has anybody written about what happened at that meeting? Yes, we know what happened in the meeting, but no, it wasn't minuted. And a lot of the events around this are cloaked in secrecy. An earlier meeting where General Sir Arthur Paget, the commander of forces in Ireland, is summoned to Britain and told about these plans for mobilisation in Ulster, those uh, those meetings aren't minuted. And when he comes back to Ireland, he tells the officers, the seven officers, including Gough, that he meets with, that you're not to write anything down in this meeting. But after people come out of these various meetings, they write things down. And that's how we have records of these events. OK, now those assurances that were signed by the Secretary of State for War were actually countersigned by the Chief of the Imperial General Staff uh, uh, General Sir John French, French or Lord yeah. French as he, as he subsequently uh, subsequently became um, so essentially well, and, uh, but what, what was the political consequence of that what did Herbert Asquith the Prime Minister make of this what looks like a total capitulation on the part of a Secretary of State for War Rumours had been abounding for many weeks anyway in, in March of 1914 that something was happening in Ulster, that the army would be forced to move on the Ulster volunteers and that, in a sense, a civil war was was in the offing. What Asquith finally had to do, and he should have done this long before the crisis, on the 23rd of March 1914, when all this crisis is up in the air, Asquith has to come out and make a formal statement that no military operations are contemplated for Ulster. Now, we know that this is uh, against the, the truth of the fact of the matter, but the fact was that Asquith had to come out and show that the military weren't going to be used for civil affairs because this was getting to a very dangerous stage at this point. OK, um, a couple of texts. Uh, somebody says, Curra incident. I always thought it was called the Curra mutiny, so that's somebody who <laughs> agrees with me. Uh, and uh, Barry Keane in Cork goes even further. He said it was a coup d'etat. The military faced down the government. Well, they faced them down, but they didn't replace them. So as opposed to, again, technically, it's not a coup d'etat, but it does have elements of that about it. OK, what impact did this mutiny incident crisis, conspiracy, call it what you will, what in- uh, impact did it have on unionists and nationalists in Ireland? I've, a lot of the thing I've been doing, I've, I've looked at this incident for several years and I've, I've taken it from various different angles, but in thinking about this recently, I've tried to look at it from the British officer's perspective because I think in some ways, and Hugh Goff is, or <laughs> sorry, Hubert Goff is unfairly treated in a lot of this, um, in, in that he was really thinking... I'm being asked to carry out civil war in Ulster. For a lot of these officers, they face the most serious decision of their life. So the impact for those officers was that they were being forced to go to the very cusp of of civil war. And this was the first civil war in British history since the 1640s. That was something that Asquith and many members of the cabinet were very much aware of. So what were the long term implications then for the for the British army or were there long term implications? I think that one of the main implications here and and the impacts of the incident is that it made the army less reliable and certainly perceived as less reliable in a broader European context. Five months later, the British Expeditionary Force would go to France and to Belgium and they would fight the First World War. For the German imperialist staff, they rubbed their hands with glee when they saw the Curta incident occurring because they said, now Britain is distracted, the army is no longer reliable and we can press on with plans in Europe without Britain wanting to intervene or being capable of intervening. You talked about home rule at the beginning of the, of the interview. Did this uh, incident stroke mutiny, did it jeopardise home rule? Home rule was heading for the statute books at that stage. It was introduced in September 1914. In terms of the Irish impact of this, it has a huge impact. It, it really made the whole question much more 
doubtful and the response by both sides in Ireland was to arm themselves because the army couldn't be relied upon to introduce civil law and to uphold law and order in Ireland. Therefore, first of all, the Ulster volunteers, buoyed on by the fact that they won't face down people who are their friends in the army as they saw it, they armed themselves. And then in July of 1914, the Irish volunteer arms faced, faced with the idea that the British army aren't going to support their cause and the Ulster volunteers are now armed themselves. So this is the beginning of Ireland being armed and stand on the cusp of civil war. What did the Germans make of all this? They must have been delighted. I think they're absolutely thrilled with the events in Ireland. This is Ireland and therefore by implication Britain completely destabilised at a point where Sir Edward Grey in the Foreign Office is looking to Europe and really worrying about the developments in Serbia, in Austria and in Berlin. And instead the whole cabinet, the rest of the cabinet, are focused on Ireland, Churchill and Lloyd George in particular. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Connor. Before we leave this topic completely, I want to mention that Trinity College historian Union O'Halpine is organising a conference to put the uh, the Curra incident or mutiny in context at the Curra Barracks on the 21st of March. He'll be bringing together national and international experts to discuss the political, legal and military ramifications of the crisis. So that should prove to be an interesting day indeed. And details of that are on our website, Connor Muldock. Thank you for joining us this evening. Connor has prepared material about the incident for our website, so you can check that out too.